Spain's coronation and the marriage to her beloved Philip. Memories and thanks along the funeral route. The Prince of Wales there. Prince William. And just yeah. incredibly moving scenes, Omar, to see the military march and step that way, to see the flags be lowered as the coffin moves past, to see the salute from His Majesty King Charles III, from the Prince of Wales. Uh, Ken, I want to bring you in on this as well. It is such a year, some of the marching coming up the mound. This is, this is, this is fit for a queen, really. So you have the Earl of Wessex, the Duke of York, the Princess Royal, the King, Peter Phillips, the Duke of Sussex, the Prince of Wales, Vice Admiral Sergeant Lawrence, the Duke of Worcester, and the Earl of Snowden. And then the Royal Cars right. behind, you have the Queen Consort, the Princess of Wales, and a car behind that, the Duchess of Sussex, and the Countess of Wessex, and a car behind that one, the Princess Beatrice, and the Princess Eugenie as well. To Her Majesty, this will be the last time she passes by Buckingham Palace before making her way. She just lasted through so many generations and through so many periods of trauma and difficulty and joy at the same time. Remember, we celebrated her silver jubilee, her golden jubilee, her platinum jubilee, platinum jubilee just unheard of in terms of uh, the royal family, really quite extraordinary. And we know that she was deeply involved in planning for her own funeral. And I really wonder if it was her idea to give the bounty such a televised the funeral live. And of course now, just about every television network, cable station across the world is probably televising this ceremony live. And I suspect that King Charles will try to carry on that tradition. He knows what a strong sense of the monarchy and support for the monarchy there is in Canada. And I think that's partly why the Queen kept coming back and back and back. She had many friends in Canada. King Charles has many friends in Canada. And so that, that deep-rooted background between, you know, the, the monarchy and Canada will, I think, simply continue. Um, as well, the Duke of Edinburgh used to come a lot on private uh, visits as well. And of course, he had his trust, which was very important. and brought a lot of Canadians into the into the some of the work that the trust was uh, was doing. And so, I think it's probably quite likely that King Charles will try to maintain that connection, that very strong connection with Canada. taking the Queen's coffin from the horse-drawn gun carriage and putting it into the hearse that will take the Queen to Windsor. Say goodbye as the Queen's coffin made its way past her home for the final time. It was, it was quite remarkable. They've been standing there probably for at least half an hour. is probably close to where you are right now, in fact. It's actually just gone by just a few seconds ago, just by the Queen. One final goodbye to the coffin, and as I say, people have been amassing here and are ready to see the, 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 this very moving, what they expect to be a very moving ceremony. Yes, and, and others um, there, but it really is about the family then taking over. Uh, and there will be, of course, that private ceremony early this evening in, in, in Windsor itself, which will be the moment when the sons and the daughters and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren can really get together and share in the bond that they built all those years with their, with their granny, with the queen, queen herself. Um, you know, with the family. And it's not the Queen's public family that is going to be at the end of this day. It's going to be the royal generations that will really now take over that this Queen is gone. All of 
just combines and comes together to tell you what an extraordinary day this is and what an immense effort that's been put in to all of this and the royal traditions that are still. <laughs> a transfer right of the coffin from the state gun carriage to the hearse to the hearse and it's a new state hearse that was designed which the queen had a hand in designing as well to maximize the windows so that you know as many people as possible can see uh the coffin and you know there's a symbolic transfer here as well away away from this big state the world celebrating and and marking uh the queen's extraordinary life so that this this transfer is is very, very, very sort of symbolic and practical as well, because obviously the gun carriage couldn't be taken all the way to Windsor. Um, so the state uh, hearse here will will do, will do that job. And as they take the the road out west, for those who know Heathrow, it'll be past Heathrow. They'll go right past the end of my road, actually, on the Great West Road. My neighbors will be out waving. Um, Let's just take a couple of minutes to watch and to listen. to every look at these people who've turned up who are lining the streets the thousands and thousands of people and those who are watching it around the world that they see this country has really seen uh, a remarkable outpouring of affection for Queen Elizabeth II and the transition of the monarchy of course to King Charles III now how do you where do you see it going what, what is your initial Impression really of King Charles III and this transition of modern. I, I think we're in good hands. I think he's had a long time to get ready and watch his moment and just see how to handle all kinds of ups and downs of our life and uh, and family life as well. And he's obviously got a few challenges there, but I think the the people of the United Kingdom embrace their monarch, and so I think whatever his interests or issues people have, have sort of had about Charles, I think they, they got over all of that. I mean, we saw Prince William and the Duchess of Cambridge, as they were then, um, in uh, the Caribbean recently. And again, there was pressure to make some sort of apology for slavery, but um, he well, he talked about it and said it was it was it was I can't remember the exact words now, but that you know it was it was odious, it was a bad thing, but to apologise is is a very big 
another very big step and he, he, he helped um, short of that. So again, that would have been on the advice of um, uh, uh, government both in this country and in the, uh, the various Caribbean realms as well. Um, with the language in that speech from the now Prince of Wales have been constructed or developed before that tour, or was there a pivot after he saw the reception? Uh, uh, interestingly, I don't know, because obviously I wasn't involved in any way, but looking, observing, and sort of judging, I think uh, Prince William probably made a very astute judgment that something needed to be said. And so I suspect, again, working with his private secretary and other advisors would have framed those words very carefully. Um, so, and it may have been in, re in response to some of the events that happened. camped out here overnight they brought their blankets they brought coolers they wanted to be here so that they would be able to get a spot to be able to see the queen as she makes her final end of this journey towards her favorite home here in Windsor and I heard you talking about giving everyone that opportunity to have that moment the hearse was designed in part by the queen she wanted those wide windows in the jaguar so that everyone would be able to have a full look inside at the casket and that is what we are waiting for right now and marie this again is five kilometers um and we expect that it's going to take 30 to 40 minutes although the schedule keeps changing but there will be enough time for everybody to look inside and take this moment in. It's such a beautiful scene here, really a sea of humanity, a quarter million people along the long walk and all throughout the day and in fact for the past 10 days we have been confronted with such arresting images of symmetry, of geometry. Now behind me there is a crowd, I think this is the biggest crowd yet uh, since we've been here this morning. And um, I, I, there are no more dignitaries who will be arriving through the barricade here behind me. Everybody is already in place. Are they hoping for a royal walkabout? It's quite possible. Um, it, we've seen it in previous uh, events. Uh, not so much for a funeral, but you know, we've seen over this past week Prince Charles, Prince William, and the rest uh, go out and thank the well-wishers and so uh, sometimes it's done at the gates of a long walk i don't know if it's going to be done there given the volume of people um could it be done here at the bottom of castle hill it's quite possible but they'll have to be patient because we have to to watch this service first a service that will include uh, traditions symbolizing the end of the queen's reign um 800 people present as uh, we mentioned earlier among them realm prime ministers governors general um and significantly i think too uh the queen staff past and present those who worked on the estate and having come here every time there was a royal event i can tell you that they're very protective of the royal family a return of sorts for the queen to this iconic gothic church down the same aisle where she was married and crowned Elizabeth II. Her late majesty famously declared that her whole life would be dedicated to serving the nation and commonwealth. Rarely has such a promise been so well kept. Her life celebrated with hymns and prayers and touchingly for another one of her famous quotes offered to console the nation during the pandemic lockdown we will meet again as the final notes of the last post faded into the abbey's magnificent vaulted ceiling 
The church and its gathering of mourners fell silent and still for a full two minutes. At the end, a lone bagpiper playing the traditional regimental lament, Sleep, dearie, sleep. Inside, 800 people filled St. George's Chapel. Among them, the prime ministers of countries of which she was head of state, and her staff, past and present, loyal until the end. Here in St. George's Chapel, where she so often worshipped, we are bound to call to mind someone whose uncomplicated yet profound Christian faith or so much fruit. Removed from her coffin, the imperial state crown, the orb and the scepter. The symbols of what were once her power and governance. The merciful goodness of the Lord endureth forever and ever. After a life of public service, this is the last we saw of the queen. Her coffin was lowered into the royal vault. As the sound of a last lament played by her piper echoed through the 15th century church. Just as she requested. The breaking of the wand. Lord Chamberlain, the senior most official in the royal household, marking the end of his service to the monarch. And it was a sense of duty and pride that drew crowds from Canada to witness their queen's final journey. Here she are seeing the coffin of Queen Elizabeth II now leave Westminster Abbey, followed by her family, now King Charles, Queen Consort, Princess Anne, her husband Sir Timothy Lawrence, Duke of York, Prince of Wales, Duke of Sussex, Duke of Philip. The end of the service of Westminster Abbey, it is by far not the end of this day, because this coffin will then process 
from Westminster Abbey to Wellington Arch, which is just behind Buckingham Palace. And over the course of the funeral there, this funeral service, it was as if there was no one on these streets. You could occasionally hear a horse's hoof on, on the gravel. You could, if someone coughed sort of across the mouth, you could hear it, but it was absolutely silent. And just a few moments ago, we saw a pretty extraordinary scene here at the palace. The gates opened and all the household staff emerged. The cooks emerged in their white chef's outfits with black armbands, all of the household staff emerged in the palace. They will now line the roads to wait for the Queen's coffin to pass Buckingham Palace one last time. As you're watching, we've been talking, Dan, Dan Snow and I, about some of what we saw in there. We saw a lot of women, which, which I think is important to note. Uh, the first female prime minister to read at a royal funeral, the first female uh, secretary of, of the Commonwealth, the Bishop of London is a woman, the master of the Queen's music is a woman. Lots of messages there, Dan. Lots of messages. We saw representation from the Catholic faith, faith as well, which is the first time that's occurred in this building once, a great Catholic building uh, before Henry VIII had his way with it and that was powerful seeing the cardinal standing there and praying for the death of a queen you're reminded of elizabeth's forebear elizabeth the first who's buried only meters away from where we've just been watching her coffin sit next to the extraordinary cosmetic pavement but in the 13th century elizabeth the first is buried just just east of there and catholic church would have certainly been saying prayers for her death but in a very very different way so a lot has changed This coffin will be carried out again to that gun carriage one more time with the family on foot behind to make a substantially longer trip to Wellington Arch. Probably about 45 minutes worth. And if, if we can get to Anne McMillan, and I know as you were listening to the service, you were taking note in particular of, of both word and song. That lovely hymn, The Lord is My Shepherd, based on Psalm 23, was sung at the Queen's wedding to Philip Mountbatten in 1947. The third hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, was sung at the wedding of William and Catherine, now the Prince and Princess of Wales, here at Westminster Abbey on the, in 2011. And the Psalm 34, which was composed by very famous British composer called Ralph Vaughan Williams for the Queen's coronation in 1953. So all those historic moments captured in this beautiful service. And as we look now at a picture from the outside of Westminster Abbey, as the coffin emerges, I, I, I can't help but wonder what it feels like where you are, Heather. and sister. 